Good morning and welcome to the final webinar of our autumn season. Uh, this one is a big one. We've had a huge turnout here, 104 registrations. We're extremely happy about that. Uh, we, we've been trying to do these webinars. We've been trying to put a huge amount of resources into getting good speakers and good topics and having a really great debate on things that are very important to housing and the continued development of. So joining me is Jonathan Walters uh, from the Regulator of Social Housing. Jonathan, good morning. Morning. And Jonathan is going to talk to us about some of the key points uh, that he's, he's discussing now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bring in our panel and we're going to have a lively discussion uh, this morning on how we're going to achieve those targets, what development departments need to be doing now to set up their asset colleagues for success in the future. Uh, now, you will also have comments and questions. Keep them coming in. I'm going to be watching that and bringing that to fruition when convenient. So uh, without further much ado, Jonathan, talk to me. What is, uh, what is, what is the scoop? Okay, so I think this is a it's a really timely conversation. Actually, hopefully you will all have seen that we pu published our sector risk profile um, at the end of last week. If you've not read it, I highly recommend it to you. It's it's a cracking read. It's about thirty pages long. It's definitely worth your your time. Um, and one of the big themes in there, as has been for the last couple of years, is this really important balance for uh, registered providers between investment in their existing stock uh, and the need for new homes across the country. So that I think we're saying right at, right at the front, there's a big strategic choice here for boards um, and for senior management teams about where they're going to, to use their organization's resources, what's the most important agenda, and what's the right balance between existing stock supply, existing stock and new supply. Um, within that context, I think the, the focus over the last 10 years, I think has undoubtedly been on new supply. That's been very much the message from, from government, you know, coming out of the, the credit crunch, very much about keep keep building counter cyclical at first, and then about trying to address the the nation's housing crisis. That has led, I think, to some very ambitious targets coming out of central government in terms of new supply. Those have fed directly into the targets that Homes England and the GLA have been trying to deliver on the ground in their areas. That means the real push from government has been on the new supply. But it feels like to us like we're at a bit of an inflection point at the moment where that balance between new supply and existing stock is beginning to change. And that's not to say that new supply has ceased to be important. It clearly hasn't. We have got something like 2 million people on council waiting lists, you know, looking to move into the social housing sector. We've got a lot of people in substandard private rented sector accommodation who would love to be in the, in the social rented sector. And we've got lots and lots of people who would love to be able to get into home ownership, whether that's through you know, help to buy, whether that's through shared ownership, whether that's buying outright. So the need for more homes you know, across the country is inarguable. But I think a combination of events over the last three years has really shifted the dial on how we think about our existing stock. You know, and the sector has got the, the, the non-LA, so private rented registered provided housing associations, own 2.6 million homes in aggregate. They're on the balance sheet at something around 190 billion pounds as social housing assets if they were all sold on the open market tomorrow you'd be looking at probably getting on for half a trillion pounds worth of, of asset value in this sector. That's a lot, that's a lot of assets to think about and, and, and to engage with. Um, and I think several things have happened and, and we are now, at, as I say, at a real inflection point. So I'm gonna kind of try and build up what I think are the, the big issues that are facing um, the sector in terms of its existing stock and how those are beginning to come together and how they, they interact with each other because I think that's, part of the crucial um, debate that needs to happen within within organizations so if, if we kind of start with where we are today what are the existing set of requirements for for housing associations to have for their stock and of course the, the legal requirement is what is in the decent home standards so what is set out by government directed to us in, in regulation that you all have to be complying with um, and if we start off right at the top when we ask providers as we do every year um, what's your compliance with the decent home standard we get told very confidently that our um, your stock com is compliant with decent homes apart from maybe less than 1%. So basically you're saying you're 99% compliant with the decent home standard. And, but that's a self-reported information that's given to the regulator. 
However, the independent English housing survey, when it when it goes out and does a sample survey, and it's, it's an external survey, but they go out and do a sample survey of social housing stock, they're reporting non-compliance rates of 13 to 14 percent um, in the social housing sector. Now that does include local authorities, so it may well be that a lot of the non-compliance they're identifying is within the LA sector, but I suspect if, if they're saying 13 to 14 percent as an independent survey is not meeting the decent homes, and the sector is reporting less than one percent. I'm not sure both of those things can be right at the same time, and I may be wrong, but my expectation would be that perhaps providers are a little overconfident, or perhaps even a little unsighted, on the the amount of decent homes compliance um, they've got in their existing stock at the moment. So I think our first challenge, and I think the first challenge for the housing association sector is how good is your information about your compliance of your stock? How well do you, as an organisation, know your stock, um, both to the kind of really granular level in terms of um, individual properties, but when you aggregate that up as well, when, when the board and the, the executive team are looking at information around stock compliance and, and the amount of work money that needs to be spent on the stock, um, how, how good is that quality of information that they're making some really big strategic decisions on? And one of the things we're beginning to focus on much more in IDAs, we have over the last, last year or so, and more so I think in the future, is what is that quality of stock information like? How good is that line of sight between the ballroom, if you like, and the properties on, on the ground? And I, I think in a number of places, it's not where it should be. The second element to that um, is the quality of the, the stock condition surveys that are being carried out and how that information is being translated into business plans. So often what we will find when we talk to organizations is they've, they've got a pretty decent stock condition survey and it comes up with a figure of you know, X million every year needs to be spent on our stock. But when you go and look at the strategic financial plan that the board are looking at or the senior executive team are looking at, the amount of money they've got in for spending on stock over the next 5, 10, 15 years doesn't necessarily reflect what's in the stock condition survey. And in a number of cases, there appears to be a breakdown between what the stock condition survey is telling people you need to be spending on the stock and what the board are actually signing off as the investment that they're planning on making. Now, sometimes that is conscious trades, and that's difficult. You know, you know, if we don't do the the roof this year, if we don't do the the bathroom replacement on that state this year, if that's pushed back two or three years, does that really cause us a problem? It's the kind of debate we have when we need to free money up to spend on other things. Uh, and that's one of the one of the dangers in this sector is you you can often push off new new um, major investment for another year or two. But ultimately, that will catch up with you. So, one again, one of our second challenges is, is to boards: is do you actually understand what the spend, what the investment needs are of your stock to maintain it at its current decent homes levels? And if you do, and if you're making trades about when you're making that spend, are they conscious, or are things getting knocked out in the process of going from the asset management team, where they've got the stock condition survey, through the finance team, into the you know, into the business planning process and, and how how is that working? And I think in a number of places we do see organizations perhaps unconsciously um, reprofiling spend, maybe deciding they're not going to spend quite as much as, as the stock condition survey is telling them. So so those those are kind of the first two big challenges, which is just about maintaining the existing stock to the existing set of standards that it should meet. So the big challenge there I think is one, are you actually meeting decent homes? Do you how do you know it? And two are you actually planning on spending the money you need to spend to keep yourselves at decent homes levels uh, and compliant with, with, the, with expectations? And I think that would be a challenge in and of itself. But I think the big challenge actually is the three things that are then layered over the top of that and then begin to interplay with each other. So um, they are in, in headline terms, building safety, a new decent homes two standard um, and zero carbon. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those and, and the challenges and the interactions between between each of those, because I do think they are they are really big big challenges um, for organisations, and they're introducing much more uncertainty in, into business plans than perhaps we've experienced over the last ten years. So over the last ten years, when you look at the overall corporate business plan, you can you can be pretty confident about the amount of money you're going to spend and need to spend on major repairs, uh, both routine and um, and kind of planned cyclical maintenance work. Um, I think over the next 10 years, you can forecast a figure now for years five or six, and you might actually find when you get to years five or six, the number is significantly different to the one that's in your business plan. So that's just introducing greater uncertainty on a on a key part of, of, of expenditure for organizations that in the past, I think people could be pretty sure 
if I tell if I say I'm going to spend 50 million pounds on major repairs next year, I, I can spend 50 million pounds on major repairs next year. I think going forward, that number is going to become much more volatile, and I think that is a risk that therefore needs to be managed because it is such a material figure um, to the business plan. I so, think that's something um, our development colleagues who deal in risk are going to be interested in. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's a major issue, um, and it has I think it has quite profound implications for organisations and where they where, what their strategic focus is over the next sort of five to ten years. Okay, so I mean, building safety obviously post Grenfell, you don't need me to rehearse what has happened and the kind of the shock that's happened to the sector and the, and the asset management part of the sector in particular. But as I see it, th there are two fundamental things going on. One is the the work that's need to be done to make building safe um, as we now understand what that what that means in a perhaps way a better way than we did five years ago but also that building safety remediation work not only on tall buildings but actually on all buildings that have had cladding and uh, and where people have been looking at looking at those sorts of issues it's pe it's really uncovered i think a legacy of some pretty shoddy um new build uh, properties so stuff particularly stuff that's gone through 106 agreements that perhaps has been taken into into the stock over the last 10, 15 years. As people have kind of gone back and looked at that through a building safety light, they've uncovered you know a nest of issues that has meant they're going to have to spend money on that stock that they simply weren't anticipating because it wasn't built to the kind of standards that they'd expected it would have been built to when when they took the property off on from the developer. So Christopher, were you going to? Is, is that is that is that what, where is that a development fault? It's a really it's a really interesting question. Um, as I say, a lot of this I think is 106 stock, so it's not stock that will have been built. But you know, I, and, and I think it's not just a social housing sector issue. I think it is a much broader UK construction industry issue. Um, the the quality of new build over the past 10, 15 years simply has not been, I think, good enough on reflection. When, and when we go back and look at that, we can see all kinds of corners that have been cut. Um, and and probably there are questions about when that stock was taken into you know onto into the organisation. What checks were carried out? Um, what did you, what inspections were carried out? How confident were you that you were receiving a good quality unit when you took it into your into your organisation? And perhaps on reflection, we can say we weren't doing the things that we would like to have done given what we know now. But at the time, you were you were operating in a, in a different environment. So I don't want to kind of cast aspersions on what happened in the past. But I think it has really shone a light um, and hopefully that will change practices going forward so that we're not dealing with this as a legacy issue um, for too long, too much longer. But, okay. but I mean, and you, and you see some of the stuff that's been coming out of the Grenfell Inquiry and some of the practices in the supply chains within the construction industry. And I think you can see why, you know, why we may have been where we are at the moment. Absolutely. Well, I can I can hear them stewing. I'm sure our panel are going to be interested to talk about that one. Uh, what else would you like to cover before we bring them on? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, so that's building safety. I think that that's definitely driving it up. Decent Homes too. Um, the white paper that was launched a couple of weeks ago um, kind of highlighted that there was going to be a separate consultation on a new Decent Homes two standard. Now, clearly, I can't say what's going to be in that in that consultation. But I can talk about some of the themes that I think are coming up that are going to be challenging. So I think some of Decent Homes too will be about the road to zero carbon uh, and, and what, what is the right things to be doing now or over the next five or 10 years that will help you get to your zero carbon target in 2050. Some of it, though, I think there will be an interest in um, not just the internal fabric of buildings, but the external fabric of buildings and, and the estates within which they sit. So I'm not sure where this will land. But one of the things that came out of the green paper process was social housing tenants saying one of the biggest contributors to stigma for social housing tenants was the kind of quality and look and feel of the estates where social housing units sat. Uh, and there's, there's definitely an interest in having a discussion about what more could be expected of landlords to do to make those estates more, more welcoming, um, less contributing to stigma. Now that's really difficult because often, land, often estates will be multi-landlord, It'll be a big role for the local authority. It won't be within necessarily within the gift of an individual housing association. Then there may be mono tenure estates where they do they can play a, a greater role, but that is going to be a challenge, uh, and obviously different challenges in different parts of the country. Sort of, uh, dense urban areas will look very different to you know smaller towns and villages uh, and rural settings. So you know there are there are some big challenges there. 
but I think there will be governmental interest in what more can landlords do to reduce stigma and make social housing properties and the estates on which they sit kind of more welcoming, more friendly, um, more aspirational, if we're completely honest, more, more a place where people would want to live. Because the feedback ministers have heard is from tenants actually is the internal fabric of my building is great. I have no complaints. My bathroom's great. My kitchen's great. My repairs are great. All of that's wonderful. But I step out my front door and I feel like I'm living in a really rotten part of town. And that, I don't want to feel like that. I want to feel like I live in a good part of town. What can my landlord do to help with that? So big challenges. Not sure what the answer is. But I think that debate is going to come. And clearly, depending on where that lands, that could lead to some big expenditure it could lead to some some big challenge practical challenges for for landlords landlords in terms of maintaining their properties and the estates and the areas within which they, within which they sit and then i think by far the biggest challenge that almost dwarf all of those is how do we get social housing stock to zero carbon by 2050 um and this is a very live debate um it's interestingly i think a liver debate outside of london and i'm broadly characterizing and caricaturing at this point but when we talk to landlords who are predominantly in London, they're basically saying that we've got a lot of tall buildings, we've got a lot of building safety issues we're grappling with. That is what we are going to be focused on for the next sort of three to five years, is sorting out all those building safety issues. The zero carbon debate we're, we're engaged in, but it is something that's going to, we're going to have to look at after building safety. Again, caricaturing broadly outside of London, the debate you will have with people is that zero carbon is the big thing. How do we get our stock to zero carbon? What does that look like? What does the spend profile look like? But more crucially, what does the technology look like? What is it we have to do to our stock? And what can we do today that is that is useful for us to do um, that will get us to 2050? And, and how quickly should we be moving to 2050? Um, and I think that is complicated then by, so that's the national government target. It's complicated, I think, by local politicians. So I think the mayors in London, Birmingham and Manchester have all said, they want the stock in their area to be zero carbon by either 2035 or 2038. Now that's a massive challenge. I mean, 2050 is challenging. Getting getting to zero carbon in a sort of 10, 10 to 15 years quicker than that is probably impossible. We'll see. Um, but like you know, we're seeing what's happening in the car industry where it was 2040 that petrol engines were going to be abolished. Now it's going to be 2030. I can I think we can expect to see the ratchet being turned on on the UK housing stock as well. So how you get to zero carbon, I think, is a really big challenge. As a regulator, we don't have the answers any more than, than you have the answers. We're really interested in the dialogue and the debate. And you can expect us, again, when we come out and do our in-depth assessments, when we do our engagement with providers, we are going to be asking boards, where are you on that journey? What, you know, what, what does it look like for you? Do you have, have you got confidence about what it's going to look like, how much it's going to cost? And we're not expecting people to say, yeah, we've got the answer. We know it's going to cost us 20 grand a year for the next 10 years. And this is the technology we're going to use. And this is how we're going to do it. We, you know, we don't expect people to be in that place yet. But we do expect that the boards are going to be starting to think about that. And that's the point I was making right at the start about the volatility of the major repairs number. You know, is that going to cost you 20 grand a unit? Is it going to cost you 30 grand? Is it going to cost you 10 grand? At the moment, you don't know. If you do know, that's great. But I'd, I'd be surprised. I certainly don't know what it's going to look like. And when you're beginning to think about your your new supply numbers, um, and you're thinking, actually, I'm going to have to take whatever I've got on my business plan, and I'm going to have to layer on top the building safety costs, the decent homes two costs, the zero carbon costs over a 10 to 15, 20 to 30 year time frame, that takes a lot of capacity out of my business. What am I then going to be able to spend on my new supply? What what does therefore my new supply look like? What's my therefore my ask of government in terms of grant? What's the right tenure mix in terms of new supply? I think it's raising some fairly fundamental questions because the sector is having to think about its existing stock, as I say right at the start, having to think about its existing stock in a way that it hasn't had to for 10 or 15 years. You know, since the, the original decent homes program ended in 2010, I think a lot of organizations maybe not taken their eye off the ball, but they've definitely, that's not been their number one issue is, is their existing stock. Their number one issue for a lot of organizations has been, how do I build more homes? How do I help solve the housing crisis? And I think, as I said right at the start, there's, there's now a recalibration of the new supply agenda, which is not going away, versus these three or four competing agendas in terms of the existing stock and, and where do we spend our money. So I said I'd talk for about 20 minutes. I think I've lived up to my brief. I've talked for about 20 minutes.
I'm you have, stop. Jonathan. No, you absolutely have uh, some really great points there for discussion. I'm going to bring on the panel and give them a little quick introduction before we get into it. Uh, so, uh, panel, if you'd like to, to, everyone, turn on your cameras, come and join the debate. Uh, Duncan Smith, Commercial Director of Walsall Housing Group, good morning. Uh, we've got Helen Spencer here, great places, good morning. Uh, we've got and Joy Winner of Broadacres, Executive Director of Growth and Investment. Is that correct, Joy? Development and investment, but close enough, I'll take that. <laughs> I came close. I gave up on Helen's because I couldn't remember off the top of my head. Helen, could you please repeat your title for me? Uh, Director of Development. Excellent. Welcome. And of course, Andrew Markham, our uh, head of our consultancy arm and new business manager. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so a uh, lot of things to talk about there. Uh, Jonathan really just did set the scene. I'm going to go to one question quickly. Uh, this is from Steve Aleppo. A DHS2 question on, and this is all about what you were saying about the multi-landlord estates, Jonathan. Uh, yes, absolutely. We hear what you're saying. Residents, they're happy with their housing a lot of the time, but they don't want to walk out their doorstep to a Siberian wasteland. Um, is the regulator minded to modify the existing regulatory standards to encourage those landlords to collaborate to improve the external fabric and quality of estates? So I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I'm going to slightly cop out here and that decent homes, although it's not one of our standards, it's actually directed to us by government. So, so the first debate will be will be driven by government. Now, clearly, we will feed into that discussion. And I think and lots of others will. We'll talk to government quite a lot about some of those challenges on multi-tenure estates and, and what can be done. And I think when we actually know what the Decent Homes 2 standard looks like, clearly we, we will look at our standards and think, how do we help facilitate this? Because it is going to be a, depending on where it lands, it's, it's going to be a big challenge for the sector. And we, I think we recognise that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm looking to the panel now. Duncan, go. Jonathan, thanks for talking to us this morning. It's really, really interesting. Um, and, um, and, and and lots of what you say puts me in one particular direction. And, um, I, you know, my part of the business is around development. And obviously, you have a relationship with Homes England and how you, those two organisations correlate and, and collaborate is really interesting to me. Um, firstly, I'm going to do a bit of sycophancy, if you don't mind. We've had a, a recent interaction with your organisation around an IDA, and it was done, um, you know, in the, the thick of COVID and across um, being online, etc. Um, and while I can't declare that that experience was a pleasant one, Jonathan, and um, by the same token, it was it was also well managed, done well, and in the context of what we had to achieve, done collaboratively. So I, I, I start from that particular point. Um, most of what you said this morning is around um, obviously improving the quality of our existing stock um, and in some cases um, there is stock in our organisations and, and I'm not being specific um, in, in mine um, which requires so much improvement the only way to do that is to knock it down and start again um, and uh, I suppose in addition to that then of issues around the public realm um, which you've alluded to as well the, the way to do that most efficiently to get the most long-term benefit is what I describe as regeneration. Um, and I suppose the gap in the current affordable homes program prospectus uh, arrangements that you'll, you'll know have come out recently is any funds for regeneration. So I just wondered how you, your organisation is able to influence Homes England maybe to, to widen that scope so that we may bring in some regeneration proposals that could get some grant funding to deliver them. Sure. So, and I started off my career actually working on uh, market renewal initiatives in the uh, in back in the early 2000s. So I completely recognise the, the point you're making. Um, I, I think to be fair to Home Things, I think this is actually a governmental issue, and I, I think the best way the sector can influence this um, is through politicians, and it is through the levelling up agenda that the government have. I, I would, this is, and it isn't a party political point. I think just. The nature of um, our country is decisions are made in London um, and they're made by people who live and, and work in London and have that that kind of perspective. It's really and it's really interesting at the moment with you know with the red wall, the blue wall, whatever whatever it is. You know, this government I think has a reason to listen to voices outside of London in a way that perhaps governments haven't much in the past. So but you know, Home England are a creature of government. They're they're you know they are they're very directly influenced by what by what ministers and what what the department want them to do. So I find the actual the real way to get get this discussion going is for it to be on on the kind of political agenda. And I think where you work in areas where you've got Conservative MPs, if you're in the north, I think the leveling up agenda is absolutely the way that that will happen. 
there has really been since 2010 an absolute anathema um, to regeneration work. There was, you know, the Pickles, Shaps era, the idea of knocking homes down with apparently a terrible thing um, wasn't, wasn't my perspective of the world, but, but it, was, it was very much theirs. And I think the only way to do it actually is a political question rather than a kind of home England question, if I'm honest. Thank you, uh, guys. Just very, very quickly, um, if well, I'm getting some feedback, so if the panelists wouldn't mind switching off your microphones until you talk, that would probably fix the problem. Thank you, uh, Duncan. Was that any, any reply to that? Yeah, I, look, it's, I, I'm, I'm not here with um, asking Jonathan to provide us with a silver bullet. That's uh, certainly not um, not not my intention. Uh, I suppose uh, the debate for us has been raging internally between stock investment and new supply. Of course, that's always a, a healthy tension, and so it should continue to be. Um, obviously, in terms of what we're looking at, most of, of the panel this morning are, are development-focused, uh, Chris. Um, we're being asked to um, put forward our plans for new development programme, um, which obviously carries with it uh, a requirement to be as efficient as possible around grant rates. Um, some of the more tricky work that we have to do is around uh, estate renewal is around regeneration activities and that costs a lot of money but by the same token it also solves the most problems so from what Jonathan's talked about this morning in terms of zero carbon building safety housing quality um, public realm quality regeneration is actually doing all of those things and bringing in them as a concerted proposal rather than investing in this then investing in that and then invest investing in that and it gives the best quality holistic outcomes so I suppose from my perspective it's just the joined up goodness, not a word, by the way, uh, between um, uh, the, the, the the regulators' requirements and Homes England investment plans. Um, and I agree it is a political will and driver to do that. But the best way to do that, in my humble opinion, is via funding um, some forms of regeneration. I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I, I think the, the point I was make, trying to make was that the best way to get that funding is, is the political will, because it's been the it was the political will that stopped, stopped those organisations in the first place. Yeah, I agree, Jonathan. I agree. I've got a question here. We're going to go to Sean Stafford. Sean, good morning. You should be in the panel, actually. And Jonathan, given this is from Sean. Jonathan, given the desire from government to accelerate housing development, can you comment on the current timescales around getting new parties registered and whether this is something you are aware of? I, no, I'm very aware of, of, of getting people registered. Um, being an RP is not an easy thing. Being regulated, as Duncan pointed out, is no fun. Um, and uh, uh, well, whenever anyone comes and, and wants to be regulated by us, I always ask them why. You know, do, do you actually have to be? Is, is my first question because you know, regulation isn't easy, uh, and being part of a regulated sector carries costs, uh, and we shouldn't we shouldn't pretend that it doesn't. Um, and and we do get quite a lot of speculative um, applications from people who I'm not completely convinced they're that interested in in the quality of the accommodation they're providing, what the service they're providing. They're interested in making money, and you know, good luck to people trying to make money. I'm, no, no problem with that. But but if you're in if you're in the regulated sector, that that's I think that means something. Um, I think if you're if you're providing long-term homes to some of the most vulnerable people in our society, you should be meeting high-quality standards. And, and frankly, a lot of the applications we get that they aren't people that are doing that. They aren't going to be providing high quality standards. And frankly, they haven't really thought very hard about some of those questions. Um, and that, unfortunately, because we get a lot of those sort of applications, um, we have to spend quite a lot of time knocking them back. And then that does that does delay, I think, some of those applications then for people who are genuine uh, and are trying to push it push it through. But we are we're working as fast as we can. We're, we are bringing more resources in actually to that part of our organisation to help with the, with new registrations. But we make we make no apology for the fact it's difficult to get registered because being a registered provider is, is an important thing and it's not something we give away easily. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Helen Spencer, I would love to hear from you on this. I'm sure you've got a lot of, of, of ideas here waiting to get. I can see. I think what I was kind of listening to intently was and, and connecting to a lot of the conversations we've been having across the Northwest with our peers and with um, Kind of other organizations that we work alongside is just the sheer number of different challenges that we're facing the sheer number of kind of themes and golden threads that fit through all of this and actually when you take a step back and think about the timing pressures we're under 
uh, in terms of securing new funding and kind of getting ourselves into a position of getting that right balance between assets, new supply, carbon, which kind of transcends both, you know, challenges around MMC, changing design standards, space standards, the difficult political environments that we work in, different expectations in different parts of our patch, even kind of just working in the Northwest, there's lots and lots of difficult, different expectations in different areas. I think it kind of draws to a head the fact that boards are going to be needing to make some very challenging decisions in the next two to three months. And I just, and, I, and whilst I understand the kind of need for it to play back through the politicians and understand that this is being driven, driven out of government, a lot of these things are actually written down in paper now. And I just wonder if there's opportunity to try and triangulate some conversations because we're almost being put in a position that that's that's uh, too difficult to kind of almost plot the fog right as, as we speak uh, further information due out of homes england in january uh, for those who who have got investment partnerships the opportunity to bid for funding from this week so it's it's kind of now and yet there's just so much up in the air No, I, I, well, I recognise all of all of that, Helen, and I, I'd say, and we say this in the sector risk profile, I think boards have got to make some really tough decisions um, with suboptimal suboptimal information, um, and and that's a really difficult place to be. I think they've also got to make decisions that will be unpopular. Um, you know, whatever you choose to do, there will be somebody saying that's the wrong that's the wrong balance, um, and some of your key stakeholders will not be happy. Whatever decision you make. Um, some of your key stakeholders will not be happy with the balance of, you know, where you're choosing to put your resources, and that's that's really difficult for housing associations. I, I think in the past people have tried to keep all of their key stakeholders happy, you know, whether that's existing tenants, whether that's the local authorities, whether that's the, the funding agencies, whether that's the regulator, you know, national local politicians, all of that. And I actually think it's basically going to be impossible to keep all all your stakeholders happy. Uh, and one of our key messages to boards is you've got to own that narrative because you're going to get kicked. You know, you're either going to be kicked for not investing and caring enough about your existing stock of your tenants, you're going to be kicked for not building enough new homes, you're going to be kicked for probably things we can't even think of. Um, and it's kind of just accepting that's the world we're going to live in at the moment. And it's really important that boards can articulate, you know, take conscious, that's why we keep talking about making conscious decisions. Because if you don't make those decisions, you're making them unconsciously. And then you're going to have to front up some really difficult discussions with local local partners, national agencies, politicians, probably the regulator as well. And I, and I think we want to kind of be mature about that, but I think it's important that the boards own those decisions. Thank you. Yeah, because it's just the other thing that I think which is really interesting to reflect on is that many of the kind of quality standards play back to a time when there was an unlevel playing field for delivery of new homes and different organisations were delivering different standards. And I think we've kind of done a lot of work as a sector to try and get one a level playing field with the private sector to be able to compete for land and to be able to deliver and get best value but with all of this i fear that we could walk back into a position where there could there, there might not be a level playing field again and i just think that's something that we all need to be very conscious of um as we as we sit sit here today yeah thanks helen good. joy i would love to hear from you <laughs> Yeah, it's thanks. I mean, uh, just yeah. <laughs> reflecting on, on everything. Yeah, I think what everybody said is absolutely true, and that that link between kind of the new AHP program and, and what <clears throat> you know and what else is coming out has been really challenging. I think you know, speaking about risk profiles, we're also asking boards, we're asking boards to consider the fact that we want to build greener and leaner, but at the same time, you know, through right to shared ownership, we could lose that stock in the space of twelve months after, after completing it. That's a real challenge. Um, at the same time, you know, as Helen said, we are a little bit being forced back into that position of not having an even playing field with the developers. So that makes land availability you know, more difficult. Section 106 is a very um, uncertain at the moment. We've got developers sitting on planning permissions because they want to see what's happening with the planning reforms. You know, we work in a, in a primarily rural area and the potential for, you know, any site under 50 units to not be required to, to supply any 106 uh, units has hit us really hard. You know, we have seen developers just saying, 
actually, I'm just going to wait now. You know, we were pressing ahead, but actually we're just going to pull back and wait and, you know, see what we can do. So I think there's a real risk that we're going to go back to where we were a few years ago, where actually our peas could be driving a real green recovery here, not just through new build, but through retrofit as well. And actually what's going to happen is we're going to see a real pause in the sector because there's just so much being thrown at us in terms of that risk profile um, and in terms of what we're asking board to consider that we're kind of gonna have to take a step back and just no pun intended take stock and understand where we are um i think one of the other things i was really interested in is that stigma view you know i think that's really really important but again we're getting these mixed messages because we've got a government who's kind of a bit obsessed with home ownership and you know that the, the recent paper that came out was kind of like oh you know horrible rental properties we want everybody to be able to buy 10 percent of their property and landlords should be paying their maintenance for the next 10 years for them etc actually there's a lot of residents who don't want to own their own home they are happy with renting or equally there are just a lot of people who let's face it that is just not a reality for them there are so many parts of the country where that's just not a reality and actually the importance is really good quality rental stock for them to live in that isn't stigmatized and i almost feel like we've got two rhetorics running we've got this really big tenant empowerment let's get rid of the stigma let's produce really fantastic quality properties which we all buy into here versus this kind of home ownership is the you know the panacea and actually unless you're a homeowner then it's not really you know you're not really worth having and, and that's not really it so i totally appreciate from your point of view jonathan again that's absolutely this is you know this is policy driven it's it's central government driven but it just is a you know it is a really tricky time for us i think um and i wear two hats so i'm development and investment so i'm in charge of kind of the new build and the retrofit program which is a really interesting and horrendous place to be at the moment you know that absolute split between the two um and I also think what's really important is that we're considering one of the things we're trying to really focus on is do it right first time. So what we're doing in decent homes is not undermining what we may need to do in the future for zero carbon. And that's a big shift for people to take. And it's quite a big ask of boards as well, because it is that real commitment now to something that they sort of see as, you know, 30 years away. But actually what we're saying is, look, by the time you start looking at life cycle and component replacement programs you need to be doing this now because otherwise you're actually creating a, a cost issue and a time issue and a you know compliance issue further into the future but again it's just it's another risk it's another you know if you're asking boards to to look at the pennies you know it's another cost that in theory you can say well do we need to spend that right now and it's that you know constant balancing those those priorities really thank you no. joy now jonathan would you care to respond i'll go there i completely reckon everything everything joy's saying and um one of the things i admire about politicians from all parties actually their ability to hold two completely separate views in their head at the same time and not not apparently see any dissonance between them it's clearly one of those skills you have to be to be a politician um so you're absolutely right in terms of the home ownership everyone should try to be a homeowner but we want to remove stigma from social housing i mean that, that you know you've seen that we're seeing that that played out and that does put i think associations in really difficult positions so I'd, I'd completely agree with completely agree with what you're saying I, and this is why i think it's so important that boards have their vision about what it is have their view about what it is they want to do because the politicians are going to push you in impossible directions if you try and keep the politicians happy I think you you've lost it really because because they, they want the impossible and it, it's not possible to give it's not possible to give them that so you know i'd, I'd agree with everything you're saying basically Joe. thank you Jonathan. duncan can, can i segue please chris can i segue into a, a maybe another question for jonathan just from something that he said um, permission to segue granted thank you uh you're much appreciated uh, jonathan you, you you were quite critical of section 106 um delivery in terms of quality um and in some ways i, I have a tendency to agree with you um those who know me on this panel um might uh, know that i'm not necessarily 100 percent the developer's friend let's put it that way um but uh section 106 is is has been a vital part of delivery um and we all know that the Plan reforms um, are proposing that that may not be about anymore, um, which is something that concerns me for our delivery for the future. But just in terms of quality, um, I suppose, you know, we have worked quite hard as a sector to get other people to warrant 
that um, third party organisations that are developing are developing to a certain standard. Um, and I accept in some cases um, this might not necessarily be about individual houses, but more about larger flatted developments that have two tenures within them, I suppose. So it might be that it's just the, the type. <laughs> which uh, or LABC, which every single property that we develop um, will have a warranty associated with it um, and um, building regulations, of course, um, in, in terms of that as well. So it kind of, you know, I've gone through a lot of Section 106 delivery th throughout my career and never really encountered any serious issues where people turn around and said, well, you haven't delivered that to quality. It's our responsibility, of course, to check that and to make sure that all of the um, mechanisms are in place to maintain it over, over time. But do you have any examples or evidence around that? Or is it just a, a feeling that people have given you as, as organisations have criticised Section 106 delivery? So, it, right, so it's, it's definitely uh, things that we've had fed back to us as a regulator um, when we're talking to people about, and it's particularly coming to light, I think, um, through some of the building safety work when people have gone in and they've looked at um, com things like compartmentalization within flatted developments uh, and it's not being built um, the way it should have been they've gone up into the roofs and found that you know the, the fire breaks that have not been in, you know just simply haven't been put there um, and they, they obviously didn't check appropriately when they took that took that property in you know in, into development um, and, and I think you know, obviously there were a spate of fires last summer um, all in timber framed um, buildings. I think there's, there's been some debate about the fire safety of, of, of timber frame, which you know, clearly if you get into that space, that's that's an awful lot of development in this country over the past 10 or so years. So so it's it, it, it's what providers are telling us that they, they're finding that they're going back in and doing the building safety work. Now, I think that is therefore providers who are predominantly urban based, predominantly in London, but, you know, but also in Manchester and and Birmingham and Leeds and some of the other parts of the of the North and the Midlands. So, so it, it might not be universal. I may be being slightly jaded by what I'm hearing, um, but but I've also had that from you know some of the major consultancy firms, you know the sort of building inspectors. You know that the, 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 they think that they would say that probably the quality of accommodation built generally, you know, across the whole of the UK industry, not just for social housing, has not been as good as it should have been over the past. And I think that was the point I was obviously dreadfully trying to make, Jonathan, is that my experience is it's not 106 based. It is the whole of the industry has not had any visibility about building safety at all. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to an extreme. And then we come back to the position of saying actually our sector is better or worse than that. I'd humbly suggest our sector is probably better than the private sector it's just now it's really really high profile and appropriately so and i think for for our sector we're we're reacting definitely better to it than necessarily the private sector is uh, uh, no i think that, that is undoubtedly true absolutely undoubtedly true i think the private sector gets away with it because most of the stock gets sold into the home ownership market and is there and is then the problem for the the homeowners um and it's definitely true i think where you see um developments in London where building safety work is taking place and an RP is the freeholder it's a completely different approach to where the where the freeholder is is a private company um, you know a completely different ethos completely different approach I mean lots of the same challenges it's not as easy for RPs to solve those problems but they are taking a very different approach I think to some of the commercial landlords okay thank you thank you very much Andrew from a viability perspective does this change anything Well, I think it does. I think uncertainty on different areas um, does, definitely. Um, if the pool, I mean, it'd be interesting to know from Duncan is what the costs of doing carbon neutral on your properties going forward. Are we, Helen, yeah, Joy, are you, are you costing that in now um, for your new properties? And what is that cost? I'm not sure that I know what the cost is for a carbon neutral home. Duncan? Uh well, Helen, do you want to go first? Because you've done some proper modelling on it, and I'll give you anecdotal evidence after Helen has finished. <laughs> well, we're in the middle of some very detailed modelling on it, so I can't give you an exact figure. And, and I think it comes back to that question of exactly where you're building and what you're building. So what we're trying to look at is the difference between apartments and houses, 
the difference between doing those in Manchester itself, for example, and in other parts of the region, because that's significantly different depending on what we're trying to achieve. So one of the discussions we're tra trying to drive out is how do exactly do we define some of these things and what exactly triggers kind of full compliance now mm -hmm. and in the future? Because I think that right first time point that Joy made is really crucial. We don't want to be building hundreds of new homes that are going to need significant retrofit and effectively store up a problem for our assets team in, in a, a few years time. So uh, what we're trying to do is look at kind of stepped stepped movement towards that during the course of the next few years and doing some detailed modelling about what those steps look like to feed into our discussions with Homes England and uh, commitments we've made to share with our sector peers in the region. So I think um, National Housing Federation have shared some initial thoughts on what those costs might be and they're eye-watering really. So we are trying to work with consultancies and, and advisors to get ourselves in the strongest position. So I think in a few months time we'll be far stronger to comment on that but in answer to your question Andrew yes it's being modelled in it has to be modelled in now because mm -hmm. of the funding availability of eight to nine years and sure. kind of fixed rate then we would be naive not to um, but we're also trying to model it in at the same time as modelling MMC yeah. right to shared ownership and everything else which makes a quite a complicated kind of set of modelling yeah. assumptions so, I'm sorry I've not got a straight answer but there's no. lots happening in it I think I, I, I look absolutely agree with everything helen said um I, I think she used the term earlier platting fog i i'm welsh knitting fog is where, where i come from uh, but they're the same things basically trying to stick a pin in a cost uh model um is is at the moment a very difficult thing to do and i'm not saying that we can't do it but it just takes a lot of time and a lot of optioning and a lot of back and forth to um, to um, obviously our finance colleagues and boards so about options and all that sort of stuff. That's a very complicated, time consuming process. But the place I wanted to start um, was around Section 106 um, and around obviously the programme desire in the new H AHP to put the shared ownership model onto Section 106. Right. And that's um, a big thing from a viability perspective, Andrew, where I want to start is that if if government and i'm going to use government want that to happen then every single viability assessment for every local authority will need to be done again before those those proposals come in because the viability of the new shared ownership model is not as strong as the old shared ownership model fact and yeah. um, so that's going to be a really interesting dynamic i don't know how we're going to uh, be able to um to to join that up uh, but anecdotally um i think you know, uh, recent tenders have come in where people have tried to do, you know, something taking standards on uh, to, to, to a point at which uh, would be compliant at an earlier point. People are talking about 15 to 20 grand uh, a property, um, which is a big old chunky number. Um, and I suppose um, uh, where we're, we're strategic partners um, and we're looking forward now with our bidding strategy, our existing programme takes us through to probably 2023, 2024. Um, so we can't deliver the new program until after we've delivered our existing program. And then we're speculating on what those costs are like in, in three or four years time. Um, and it's a difficult thing to do because it's a difficult thing to do to know what our strategy should be against what Jonathan's articulated in terms of our existing stock. And if you've got double bubble, um, so mm -hmm. you've got the cost of investment going up at the same time as cost of development going up, then um, Jonathan's gonna be tapping me on the shoulder saying, Oi, pal, can you redo your business plan with some sensible numbers in it? Thank you. Thank you. I've got some questions here. Um, we're going to go to that. Um, so to begin with, regulate, regulatory ratings question. Different organisations are clearly at different stages of factoring new investment, zero carbon, DHS2, enhanced safety for both existing and stock into their BPs. And this is likely to be the case for the next couple of years. I'm not sure. Is this likely? Is that what you meant to say? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, no I think it's exactly right. I think people are on different trajectories, different, you know, I, I can't think of another fog analogy, but it's, you know, it's absolutely right. You know, there, there is there is so much to try and see through here that some people are going to get, people are going to go at different speeds. I think what we're looking for here is that boards have clocked this is an issue they're actually getting on with it they're beginning to have those discussions we're not saying people should have the answer now because I, I don't think any of us know definitively what the answer now is nor do we nor do I think saying oh it's all too difficult let's wait five years to, to see how things settle down that, that's not an acceptable answer either so we're saying start thinking about it 
you know, it's the quality of the decision making, the quality of the thinking we're interested in, not the answer itself, I think, if I'm honest. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Steve, for that question. Steve Lepper there from Sovereign. Um, Tony Price has come in with a question which, uh, thankfully, it's all about my favorite subject, MMC. Um, any, <laughs> any views on MMC and zero carbon? It, could MMC be the solution here? What do we think? I'm going to have to the rest of the panel. I would hate to. Jonathan? I'm not giving an answer. Okay, Joy? Joy's had well, experience. We've my, yeah, we've heard, we've heard my opinions on MMC previously, haven't we, in a, in a different panel meeting. So I'll, I'll, I'll rein it in again for today. I'll be politically correct as I was last time. Look, it is part of the solution, isn't it? It is part of the solution, but it is not a golden bullet. There is not a silver golden bullet, whatever colour bullet you want. It doesn't exist. So I think what worries me slightly is the obsession with MMC and the constant pushing of MMC as the answer. There is no one answer to this, as Jonathan has so well articulated. There is so much going on, there is so much to consider, and there are a number of actions which need to take place for us to solve this. There is not one solution. So, you know, modular construction, is is something which we currently talk about a lot but actually different methods so timber frame steel frame you know these methods have been actually been used for quite a long time we've all in the sector been using them for quite a long time and there is you know there is lessons to be learned from from the past of when kind of people have jump two feet into things and then had to come back and, and deal with it later and that's a little bit where we are now isn't it with you know with trying to retrofit our properties and a little bit about the conversation you know Jonathan was having about 106s and the quality and that sort of thing so I think we've got a lot to learn about MMC I think we need to be careful because MMC is a huge category of types of buildings and a huge there are huge numbers of options and I just think the sector gets a bit obsessed with MMC and as in the modular version of it will be built in a factory and delivered to site on the, you know, the back of a, a wagon. And actually what we should be doing as a sector is considering all of those because there's a lot of options there and each one of them has their time and place and each one of them is part of the answer, but it is not the answer. And we'd love an answer, we'd love it. We'd all love to sit here and say, oh, fantastic, we found this particular modular, it's zero carbon, we're all happy with the maintenance and management of it, it's totally affordable, the factory can skill itself up so that it can absolutely supply all of us across the country with what we need. Brilliant, but you know, that's not it. And the more we kind of look to MMC to be this sort of panacea and this one answer, I think the more we distract ourselves from actually just getting down and doing the hard work that there's going to be a number of things which which you know solve these problems not not one thank you joy helen we haven't heard your views yet on mmc i would love to hear those i was just actually going to bring it back to customer as well because we've done an awful lot of work on mmc and, and, I, and i second everything you've just said about kind of the, there's a huge spectrum of what mmc looks and feels like and you know we're all trying to work out what that might look and feel like on different projects and how it's going to work for different organizations but actually, if we're all striving to do as much as we can fabric first, whilst also getting towards zero carbon, there is going to be a need to use new technology. And for that, there needs to be a shift in customer sentiment. There needs to be kind of new products which people can get used to. And for some of our customers at the moment, kind of standard, the standard offer is quite complicated to get to get your head around, you know. Um, and I think we need to, we need to, we, you know, when we are thinking about the customer at the centre of everything we're doing, we have to try and piece that into the mix as well. So it is a change in 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 sentiment to see how it's being delivered. For example, off the back of a lorry, or being pieced together uh, in a series of panels, uh, mm. and then you move in, you go into that home, and there's a whole new set of technology in there. I think we need to kind of make sure we keep an eye on what that is like for our future customers. Um, but I think MMC, in, to answer the question directly, is part of the answer, and I think it does help. Will help in certain circumstances to get to zero carbon once we've defined what that is in different locations, and once we've just started to define what that looks like on different types of MMC, and then we've worked out what that means for our asset teams and our repairs teams, and crucially, what it means for those people moving into those homes. I think we need to just we need to make sure it ties back to that customer focus as well as kind of kind of getting locked into that technical answer. Thank you very much, Helen. 
Um, Duncan, your, 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 your views on MMC, are they unchanged? Would you like to sort of bring us up to speed on those? I agree with Joy and Helen, part of a varied offering in terms of delivery. In fact, letting you into a secret, we're probably going to exchange contracts on our first large scale scheme of MMC today. Um, so, um, yeah, it is part of the overall delivery. I'm going to segue again, Chris, into something that is really important that we haven't talked about yet. And in the context of obviously what's happening with the economy um, and, you know, to hear about Debenhams and Topshop and all of that sort of stuff. And I'm not saying um, necessarily that's the link to what I'm about to say next, but social value. I think next year is going to be just the biggest year possible that every single piece of our investment, whether it's in our existing stock or in our new build, has to come with social value and job creation tags with it. Um, because we're going to be part of the solution of, of trying to create some um, economic benefit from the investment that we put in. Um, I just wanted to wave that flag. You know, our organisation, I'm not holding up as a bastion of virtue, but it's really high, high profile for us. And, um, and I think back to Jonathan, and I know he, he, he will probably agree with me, I can't put words into his mouth, that, um, you know, the duty for our organisations to get the most social value from the activities we do is uh, is something that needs to be reinforced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Duncan. We've got some questions coming in here. So we're running up to 11. We've got a few minutes left. I'm going to try and get through these questions. Um, so David Heels, very sensible discussion. Thank you, David. We do our best. This term zero carbon as is great as a general term, but as you say, it's in development. As a small organization, I'm struggling a little to turn this into specifics. What does it mean for heating, insulation, etc.? Should I just continue to wait to be led by government, NHF, regulator, and the bigger players in the sector? What should I, what should I be investing into this area now? I think Helen has just partially answered this. Would anyone like to take a, a stab at that one? I would say, I, I don't know where you are in the country, but there, I would think there's a col collaboration in your area that's already working through, and we welcome as many people to get involved in that discussion. So uh, um, reach out to local organisations because there's a lot, awful lot of sharing going on in the sector, and that I that would be what I would encourage. Thank you, Helen. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I would just say it goes back to Jonathan's point about know your stock. You know, if you're a small provider, then potentially you have great opportunities to really understand your, your stock data. And that's the key to this, because if you're starting off with your good data, then once you are looking at what does this actually mean, what do I need to consider in terms of heating, insulation, etc., that's how you're going to make that journey a lot smoother, basically. Um, you know, we're, we're 6,300 units. We're not huge. And um, we sort of had an ethos of, let's start with what we know. So let's pick some low hanging fruit kind of thing. So let's do some insulation on those properties where we know that's important. Let's look at switching to an air source heat pump program where we are coming to replacement cycles for electric heating, et cetera. And they're quite, I want to say they're quite simple steps that we knew would not come back and bite us later on. Just, you know, and there was a real kind of just do it. This is not going anywhere. Let's just make those decisions that absolutely make sense. And we've got time to, you know, work through the kind of really big, you know, hard to treat properties and that that kind of overall program. So that, that would be my advice. Thank you. Um, right, another question here, Guy Collar. How do we ensure that the recent MMC disasters highlighted in the housing press room don't come back to haunt us? <laughs> All right. Ask me one on the sport, Chris. <laughs> yeah, look, it's it's a really difficult thing when you when when you're trying to get to a position of pioneering something, um, and you know there's lots of people trying to do lots of things for the benefit, and sometimes, unfortunately, when you're pioneering stuff, things can go wrong. Um, so we have to start out relatively small scale. Test, 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 test for as long as you possibly can. It's exactly the same as the vaccine, let's be honest. Um, and and then once you've got something which works, then we can roll it out. Um, I, I don't have a better, more cognizant plan than that. Um, my, my other colleagues may. 
Joy, Joy, I know that you had some some stinging issues in the past. How how have you tackled retackled the the MMC? You haven't abandoned it. You're, you're still you're still a supporter. How have you gone back to it with a with a high, a better risk approach? Yeah, so I think it's really what I said before, which is about you know it's a test, 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 but also research, research, research. Push the people you are working with push them, do not listen to the sales pitch, get in there, get under the skin of the technical detail, ask to see their evidence, ask to understand where they've done it before, ask have they tested this in a factory setting, ask to see what the results are and, and you know, quite frankly, be a bit of a pain in the bum. It goes a bit back to that 106, you know, conversation. The way that we got around that was we got, you know, we employed in-house clerk of works who made themselves a bit of a nuisance to the private developers and would turn up on site and say, you know, actually, while you're there, can I have a look in that, you know, cavity to see what you're doing in terms of that? And that's what we have to do with MMC. You know, we're the best in the world. They're there to sell you a product and it's about getting underneath the skin of it and pushing them in terms of where are they, where is their information coming from and just ensuring that, you know, you've got things like the warranty providers on board with that and get everybody in the same space to have an open conversation. Like get your maintenance teams, get your asset teams, get them in the room from day one because they are the ones who will ask the challenging questions. Yeah, so you need a Columbo. <laughs> What gets measured gets done, as Andrew would say. Unfortunately, he dropped out because his internet collapsed. He's actually still. Uh, Helen, your advice on shopping for MMC. How do you avoid the fly-by-night companies? Well, research, I think, was the word that was used. That I would uh, Research and curiosity land very much with me, but I think the word that, that is missing is learning. So I think it's really important to just take stock of what's happened. The pressure on the sector to deliver MMC is not going anywhere. It's getting bigger. And actually, so we need to take stock of what's happened, learn, collaborate, share our information, and like you say, get right under the skin of what's happening in these factories and recognize that some of these organizations are still really embryonic and we've got the opportunity to influence what they're doing get stuck in you know really have influence and and support their businesses as they evolve other organizations have gone to the other end the other extreme haven't they and established large manufacturing facilities and that can be harder to influence so i think it's about what suits your organisation to get to understand what's going to work for you, and if and if it if it does come back to the fact that you want to be building in different parts of the country where the standard profile might not work, then perhaps working with the smaller organisations to influence, build their capacity, make sure you're getting the quality, and that they are welcoming of you in that plant. That might be part of the solution, uh, and that's certainly something that's gaining some traction in the north. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you. Um, we're at about 11.02 right now. Um, if any of the panelists need to go, they absolutely can. I've got one last question I'd I, I want to get through, if that's okay. Um, it's from Claire Hudson. What are the panel's view on ICF construction and how widely is used is it currently on projects by the sector? I'm not from a development field, clearly in brackets. Never heard of it until I saw it being used by Sarah Beanie on her new house program. Does anyone know about ICF construction? I'm afraid okay. that's not something I can okay. comment on. <laughs> so sorry, Claire. Well, well, I love Sarah Brini. I obviously missed that episode. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think. Okay, well, I'm afraid, Claire, we're not really sure what Sarah Beanie's doing at the moment. Um, <laughs> however, um, but let us know write to us and we can we can try and uh speak to us afterwards i'm going to wrap up today it's been absolutely brilliant it's been a really great discussion we've had a fantastic panel here i'd like to thank jonathan for coming on board and, and doing this we really appreciate it we hope to see you in our next season this is the last webinar of, of the season of our second season we started it in march it grew and then we made the the decision to keep it going through autumn which worked very very well so i would really love to thank our panelists um, i would love to thank duncan smith for his continuing support i'd love to thank Pleasure. joy winnera uh joy's been brilliant through through the first season and now thankfully coming on at the end and helen this is the first time we've had you on i really hope you come back again. I know that our marketing team and Ricky Prota, who's our, one of our new business managers, is, is a huge fan uh, of the company and what you're doing and really does want you to be more involved in our webinars going forward. We're gonna have 
uh, in the early year, a, a new, uh, it's going to be released, the new agenda will be released on our website. Look out for that. In the meantime, we wish you all a very happy holidays and uh, things are getting so much better. So thank you all for tuning in and see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. guys. Bye.